There's a thin line between innovation and doing some completely like 100% new shit. And successful innovators learn how to walk it. Hey, what's going on, y'all? Welcome back to my channel. I'm Nanurl, and this is Unpacked Angles with me, where we're focused on widening the perspective on all things UX and more. And today we are getting into the laws of UX. So the laws of UX that I'll be talking about are just a collection of heuristics or rules of thumb that designers and other UX professionals should keep in mind on a daily basis. A lot of these laws are principles studied in psychology and UX is all about knowing people, the way that they think and why they do the things that they do. So what better way to understand the human mind than to study psychology. I'm breaking this up into two parts for two main reasons. One, there are 20 laws that I'll be going through and I'm not trying to keep y'all here for more than 20 minutes. And reason number two is I was able to group them in a way where one group focuses more on the UI side of things and the other group focuses a little bit more on the UX side of things. So why not? There's a beautiful website that has been made that goes over each of the 20 terms and gives more resources. So I'll be sure to link that in the description. So let's get right into it. The first law I want to talk about is Hicks law. Hicks law states that the time it takes to make a decision increases with the number and complexity of choices. So if you think about analysis paralysis, this is that. If you have ever in your life used Netflix and have had trouble choosing a movie, then this is something that you have experienced. The more choices you give people, the harder it is for them to make a decision. So it's best to simplify choices by breaking things down into smaller steps. Give people one thing to focus on at a time. Another thing that you can do to help with this phenomenon is highlight choices that you recommend or key actions that you want people to take. If there are a number of choices that you are providing for people to choose from, recommending the ones that are maybe most popular or highly recommended can be helpful. Also use progressive onboarding. Help people do things one chunk at a time. If I'm trying to learn how to change my profile picture, that's what I'm focused on and that's what I need help with. Progressive onboarding helps to lessen the cognitive load, which essentially just means it helps people to not have to think too hard. You don't wanna explain everything at one time. Pace yourself and space out that learning so people can have time to actually digest the information you're giving them. Next is Jacob's Law. Jacob's Law states that users spend most of their time on other sites. When it comes to websites, most people are not gonna spend most of their time on your site. They'll be on other sites, so people will have expectations that you will be expected to meet. Their expectations will be set. So there is a strict balance between innovation and reinventing the wheel. We don't wanna introduce something completely new to the point where people have to learn basically everything. They're going to already have their mental models set, which means that they have a way of thinking and an expectation of how things are going to work that if you're not able to meet those, then there might be some friction there. So use those mental models so that people don't have to relearn things. When people have to learn things, it takes time, effort, and it can cause so much frustration. It's best to just let people focus on their goals, on the task at hand, whatever they're trying to accomplish without having to literally figure out how to use your product. So keep in mind, while you might have a bomb website or a bomb app, just know that there is a standard that has been set, usually by a lot of these bigger companies or by the masses. So you trying to reinvent what a home icon looks like might not go well for you. So there's a thin line between innovation and doing some completely like 100% new shit. And successful innovators learn how to walk it. The next law is Miller's Law. So this law states that the average person can only hold up to about seven-ish things in their working memory at one time. I personally say about maybe four or five, but maybe I'm just speaking from personal experience. So in order to keep this in mind, it's important to present information in a manageable way. You don't wanna give people too much to look at or too much to do. In psychology, there is a term called chunking, where you group individual items into larger units. This technique helps to improve the amount of information that people can actually remember. So for example, when you think about 
phone numbers. Those are 10 individual digits that we put into three different groups to help us remember them. I don't know if that's still the case today as far as like helping us remember numbers because I personally don't remember anybody's phone number now, but it's not really required. So maybe that's why. So if you have individual pieces of information that you would like for people to remember, using grouping techniques can help. Next is the peak end rule. So the peak end rule states that people will judge an experience by its peak and its end, and not by every single moment throughout the experience. So when it comes to your product and the experience it provides, it's most important to make sure that your critical experience points and your endpoints are all on point. <laughs> that means it's super important for you to understand where your product is most critical. Where is it most helpful, most valuable? Where is that point in your product or those points that elicit the most desired emotion that you are trying to draw out of your users? Once you know where those points are, it's your job to make sure that those moments are great. Keep in mind, people are going to remember negative experiences way more than they do positive ones. So at the very least, make sure that these points in your user's journey through your products do not provide a negative experience. The next law we're getting into is called Pastel's Law. This is also known as the robustness principle. So this law is all about being liberal in what you accept and conservative in what you send. And I know that sounds very like conceptual and ambiguous and what the F. I know that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't to me. <laughs> so let's dive deeper. You can think of your product as having two faces. So let's use the example of a website as a product. You have the part that faces users, so human beings, and the part that faces the machine, like the system. So which one of those faces do you think is more important? I'll give you five seconds. Don't worry, take your time. I really need a fill. Okay, we're back. So which one did you guess? If you guessed one or the other, eh, you're wrong. It was a trick question. They are both equally important. At the end of the day, your product serves people. So of course you have to be able to interface with human beings successfully. However, if we're talking software, your product is also connected to the system. So how is it gonna be able to serve people if it can't even communicate with the system upon which it is built? It can't, so you gotta have both. In this law where it talks about being liberal in what you accept, that liberal face is on the people side. People do all sorts of things in so many different ways. They are the biggest variable. You want your product's interaction with people to be as normal as possible. And because people do so many of the same things in different ways, that can be tough to nail down. So what you really have to understand when you're creating this product is how people do the things that they do and what you will accept. Conceptual things tend to confuse me a lot of the time. So let's throw this into an example. If there was a product that I was interacting with, a website that had a form where I was supposed to enter my birthday, there are a number of ways that I could go about doing that. So let's say my birthday is January 2nd, 1995. I could enter 01 slash 02 slash 95, 01 slash 02 slash 1995, 1, 2, 95, Jan 2nd, 1985, January 2nd, like, etc. If we keep this within the realm of the United States, the creator of that form is still going to need to understand that people may enter their birth dates differently. So if that product was liberal and what it accepted from me, I could enter 0102 1995 or Jan 2 1995 and still have that be an acceptable entry. Now bringing it back to Pastel's Law where it says being conservative in what you send, that is more so on the machine side. The conservative face faces the machine and faces the system. So I'm putting in my birth date information. Cool. The product sees that I've entered Jan 2, 1995. However, the system itself was built in a way where it can only understand 0102, 1995 as a date. So in order for the product to communicate with the system, it needs to be conservative in the ways in which it sends this information. That is, it can't just send in whatever I type. It can't just send in any old thing to the system because the system will not understand anything that is not 
1902 1995 that format so i can enter anything that i want potentially as far as dates go and that product should be able to take in what i say configure it in a way that makes sense to the system and send only that format to the system so being liberal in what it accepts and conservative in what it sends now, of course, constraints will be necessary. I can't type in orange as my birth date and have that be acceptable. So creating constraints around things that are out of bounds is very important. Now, depending on the robustness of your system, you may want to set more constraints as the creator of this product. Maybe you don't want to accept every single way people can enter a birth date, and that's fine. But keep in mind, if you create more constraints than people typically have in normal conversation, then that can put a strain on the UX of your product. Next, we have Tesler's Law, also known as the Law of Conservation of Complexity. Larry Tesler, who came up with this law, actually recently passed, so rest in peace. You might be familiar with some of his work. He is the reason why you can copy and paste, so big ups to him. But Tesla's law states that for any system, there is a certain amount of complexity that cannot be reduced. It's kind of similar to the law of conservation of energy, which states that the total energy of an isolated system is constant. It cannot be created nor destroyed. Complexity within a system works the same way. Tesla is quoted saying, every application must have an inherent amount of irreducible complexity. The only question is who will have to deal with it. So once you get down to it, the complexity within your system that can't be reduced is either gonna be put on the user or the system. So if we take the example I just used from Pastel's Law about the website where I have to enter my birthday, as the creator of that product, I need to figure out where this complexity needs to go. If I create a very robust system where I let users enter any type of format for a date for their birthday, I'm saving the user from that complexity, but I'm adding it to my system. So if I enter as a user January 2nd, 1995, the system is going to have to do the work to transform that information to the one format that the machine actually understands. However, if I was to take the complexity off of the system and put it onto the user, that would look like a very constrained system where I, as a user, would be required to enter 01-02-1995 and nothing else. That way, anything that I enter is going to be automatically understood by the system, no complexity on the system side, more complexity on the user-facing side. So as creators, we have to choose where to put this complexity. Which side should it go to? What's the right answer? Of course, it depends. Side note, it depends is the most UX answer you will ever get for anything. So if you have not already experienced hearing it depends a lot and you're just getting into UX, just know that you will hear it many, many, many times because it always does. But a great way to figure this out is to know the value or cost this complexity has on your users. There is a way to calculate this, but I won't go into it right now. I've linked an article in the description that talks more about how to actually calculate that. Next is the Zygarnik effect. I actually don't even know if I'm saying that right, but I think it's close. This states that people remember uncompleted or interrupted tasks more than they remember the ones they've completed. People tend to have very intrusive thoughts when they haven't completed a goal or an objective. Your brain actually sends signals to you that lets you know that you were doing something that you did not finish. So when you think about TV shows and the cliffhangers that happen after each episode, the episode is over, but the story isn't complete. So this leaves you on edge on purpose. This is done intentionally so that it stays on your mind and keeps you coming back for more. It is part of why people get really upset when their favorite shows are canceled before the story has been complete. Same thing with movies that have open endings. You find yourself thinking about them a little bit more because the story was not over. A really good way to take advantage of this effect in design is to show progress indicators. So things like progress bars help people to understand that there are still more things to do in order to complete this action. LinkedIn does a pretty good job of using this for their profile completion. So there are a number of steps that 
that you need to take in order to complete your profile. And if you have not taken all of the actions that LinkedIn's creators want you to take, then they'll show you, you still have X amount of steps left before you can have an all-star profile. So if there are actions that you want your users to perform and finish, then using progress indicators are a good way to encourage people to actually finish. Next is the Pareto Principle. If you've watched or listened to part one of the UX term episode, then this should look familiar. The Pareto Principle is also known as the 80-20 rule. And this principle states that 80% of the effects are a result of 20% of the causes. Now, of course, I need to use an example every time I discuss this principle because it is super conceptual to me and that is beyond <laughs> my mind. As it applies to design, your users will spend 80% of their time on only 20% of your product. So for example, Instagram, right? Anytime something happens with the timeline, Twitter goes nuts. The timeline is not the only part of Instagram, but it is the place where people spend most of their time. So if something happens to it, like for instance, that one time when Instagram thought it would be cool to change scrolling into tapping in order to browse, everybody went crazy on Twitter because nobody was with that shit. So that one feature of Instagram caused all this chaos. So the timeline is that 20% that causes the biggest issues when there's an issue. Something so small can result in catastrophe. Thank God they changed it back. But it can also apply to positive things as well. So when it comes to productivity for me, I spend about 30 minutes to an hour planning out my week. Those are usually my most successful weeks because I spent this one hour planning for 40 plus hours in the future. It made such a difference. And the same thing applies for when I don't plan out my week. If I don't take that hour, my whole week is bound to be shitty. It's not gonna be productive at all. Of course, the 80 and 20 is not really set in stone. It can vary, but overall, it's definitely something that we can see and experience all the time. Next is the serial position effect. This states that people are more likely to remember the first and last items in a series. When you're designing a series or a list, it's best to put the most important information that you want people to remember either at the start or at the end of your list. Anything that you would deem as less important, plop that baby in the middle. Placing key actions to the far left or the far right, like in navigation for instance, can help with memorization. This is all due to the primacy and recency effects. So the primacy effect has to do with people remembering the first item in a sequence and the recency effect, you guessed it, has to do with people remembering the last item in a sequence. So this is very important to keep in mind, especially during UX research. So if you're creating a survey that has multiple answer choices or even trying to get feedback on different versions of designs, it is important to make sure that you randomize those choices in order to avoid biases as an effect of the recency or primacy effect. And it makes a real difference too. And the last law I wanna get into is called Parkinson's law. Now this law refers to the old saying that basically states that your work or any task that you're doing will take up the full amount of time that you have available to do it. So generally speaking, the time you have to perform a task is the amount of time it'll take to complete it. Yet another abstract concept-y thing that I can't fully wrap my head around without examples. So here we go. This was originally brought up in regard to bureaucracies. So like companies, the bigger an organization gets, the more work it has to do. So like the more work it creates for itself. Now, if we kind of take it out of that context and put it into like more general things in life, you can see this in how we eat and our portion sizes. So for example, if you were to have a huge plate, and you fill that plate with food, you probably will not feel satisfied until you finish that plate. However, if you were to have a smaller plate, maybe something that's like a regular, like healthy portion size, and you finish that plate, you're gonna feel that same satisfaction as you would have if you had a bigger plate. This is why nutritionists and other health advocates encourage people to buy smaller plates so that they can actually eat smaller portion sizes. You're still gonna be really satisfied with what you eat, it's just kind of a trick that you can play on your mind because you actually don't need all of that food. But I think the most important application, at least as it relates for me, is when considering time or time management. 
we've all probably had essays or assignments that have been due. So if I was to receive an essay assignment on Monday and I started on Monday and it's due on Friday, it will take me the entire week to do. Whereas more realistically, if I received that essay assignment on Monday and I didn't start till Thursday and that joint is due on Friday, it's just gonna take me a whole day to do that essay. It might not be as robust and fantastic as the essay and the scenario where I started on Monday, but it's actually pretty damn good, especially for an essay that was started the day before. So then it prompts you to think like, how long do things actually take? This one day essay is so good because I was forced due to my time constraint to think outside the box. How else can I do this and do this well with the time that I'm given? So it's very clear that I actually didn't need all week to do an essay. I could have just did it in one day, which is true for most of the tasks that I have. We often overestimate the time that we need to do things, but that time constraint puts a little pressure on us to do things a little bit differently than we would have done if we didn't have it. It forces us to level up a little bit and think of new ways of doing things, which is why I'm not ashamed of my procrastinator ways. I actually don't have a way that this specifically ties into UX. So if you can think of any, I would love to know. So the question I wanna leave with you guys today has to do with the Parkinson's law. I talked about how I work a little differently now after having learned what it's about in my working style and the time that I actually do or don't need to do certain things. So my question for you is what tasks, either weekly or daily, do you think you can level up on, get creative with, and do in a shorter amount of time? Let me know in the comments. And that is it for part one of the UX laws. I hope that it was helpful for you. I hope that you learned something, took away something to apply later on or maybe even today. As always, hit me up with any questions, any feedback that you would like to give, comments, all the works go ahead and leave them. If this was helpful for you today and you wanna stick around on this ride, be sure to subscribe. And if you wanna get notifications for whenever I post new content, hit that notification bell as well. I post every other Wednesday. You can check us out here on YouTube, on the website, unpackedangles.com. And you can check us out on social media at Unpacked Angles on Instagram and Twitter. But it's been real, y'all. I'll catch you later in part two. Deuces.